I have the honor to introduce uh, Dr. Harsh Reji. Uh, he is an alumnus of uh, the Christian Medical College, Velour. He completed his postgraduate studies in community medicine, and uh, he was the best outgoing student. Uh, and then <clears throat> uh, he was uh, he was always interested in the underprivileged and in social justice, which was one of his passions. He worked in the Tribal Health Initiative in Sitlinji, which was founded by his parents. And he serves the Malavasi tribe in Dharmapuri district, not very far from here. And he is a part of many national and international collaborations. And uh, it'll be very interesting to listen to him as he talks about equity in the healthcare arena. Over to you. Thank you for those kind words of introduction, sir. Uh, I'd like to thank the Department of Medicine and Dr. Anand Zakria for giving me this chance to talk. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harsh. Uh, I'm here to represent the 12th September movement. Uh, we are a collection of health professionals, teachers, lawyers, and journalists working towards an anarchist feminist un understanding of health. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, health professionals' role in bringing equity through health policy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to divide my talk into four uh, four sections. I'm going to try and understand a historical perspective of how equity and health came up. I'm going to talk about three movements in health. I'm going to talk about the current scenario when it comes to policy and raise some questions about the way ahead. So to start with, I'm going to take you all 180 years back. Uh, the, the first reference to equity in any health journal or in a context of health was first published sometime in the 1860s. But even before that, uh, a few people led the way when it came to equity and health. So I'd like to talk about three reports. The first in uh, 1842 by uh, Chad Wick, who was uh, entrusted by the government to look at the sanitary conditions of the laboring population in Britain. Uh, he found that the sanitary conditions were terrible and there was a big gap in life expectancy between classes. He pushed this and brought about the first Public Health Act uh, in England in 1842. Three years after that, uh, Frederick Engels, uh, in his studies, looked at the condition of the working class in England. And what he found was, though life expectancy from certain amount of medical uh, uh, medical advances came to the higher state of society, the living conditions of the average worker was in worse than what it was pre-industrialization. In three years later, uh, we jumped to Silesia, which was then a province of Prussia, and look at what Rudolf Virchow did. So Wachow was a medical professional and he was entrusted by the Prussian government to study the typhus epidemic in, in Silesia. So apart from the medical recommendations he made to control the typhus and the pandemic in that place, he made a lot of uh, interesting recommendations. So some of his recommendations to control disease at that point was introdu introduction of Polish as an official language because they had an impoverished Polish minority over there democratic self-government, separation of church and state, and the creation of grassroots agricultural cooperatives. Uh, after coming back from Silesia, he founded a newspaper called Medical Reform, which was shut down a few years later. And two of his most famous quotes, that medicine is a social science and the physician is a natural attorney of the poor, come from this. Virchow's uh, work and his thoughts at that point of time had a wide, uh, a wide ripple effect and felt more so in Latin America. A lot of Latin American medical professionals and teachers took this up. And um, one of the most famous doctors who went on to become president, Salvador Allende, was a student of Virchow's writing and took both of these statements to heart uh, later on through his presidency. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead a few decades to the constitution of the WHO. So two things are there. Uh, I mean, the constitution of the WHO is long. But uh, two things are mentioned very specifically there that I'd like to point out. The first is that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, and social conditions. A second, uh, this is not the second point in the Constitution itself, but the second point I want to raise is the extension to all people of the benefits of medical, psychological, and related knowledge is essential to the fullest attainment of health. I will come back to this statement later. Um, in Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they also mentioned that everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being for himself 
and it goes on to talk about a broad definition of health, uh, including social services, uh, things like employment and so on. Uh, one theory that I'd like to uh, just put in here was proposed in 1971 uh, by Julian Tudor Hart called the Inver Inver inverse care law. Uh, he goes on to say that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need of the population served and that medical services are not the main determinant of mortality or morbidity, but also depends on standard of nutrition, housing, work, environment, education, and the presence and absence of war. And that redistribution is as important as improving care for everyone on the lines of equity. Uh, seven years after that, in 1978, on the 12th of September, the declaration of Alma-Ata was signed by 134 governments across the world and a whole bunch of international agencies. And for the first time, I think globally as a species, the declaration uh, recognized that there is a grow, uh, there is an inequality when it comes to the health status of people between developed and developing countries as well as within uh, countries, and that it's a, it should be of concern to all countries. Um, of the many things that Almata spoke about, which most of us have learned in medical college, uh, in community medicine. But I want to point one thing that is uh, sometimes overlooked, because we talk about primary care and we talk about the pillars of primary care and what all to do. But one thing that the Almata Declaration recognized was that we need an economic uh, and social development based on a new international economic order. And that is of basic importance in the fullest attainment of health for all. The new international economic order, so 1978 was in the middle of the Cold War, and the new international economic order was something pushed by the non-aligned movement by big countries leaning towards socialism like India, Egypt, Yugoslavia, and recognizing that uh, countries having more control of their own uh, economic uh, interactions not falling to larger market forces was important. Sadly, soon after the declaration of Almata, though such a broad uh, understanding of health was proposed, uh, due to the structural adjustments in the 1980s and the fact that in, in UK with the Margaret Thatcher and, and Reagan in US and the, grow, and the growth of the medicine industrial complex, there were, and the fact that medicine became an industry, though in, in 1978 we recognized that the world recognized that medicine is a right, but with, with, with that growth, um, uh, the, the dream of Alma Atta, one could say, was, was diminished. The invisible hand of Adam Smith slowly pushed millions into poverty. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to look at, so this was what I felt as a, a history of health equity to the years. I'm, I want to look at three, three movements and three places where medical professionals have been able to make a large impact on health policies. I'm going to first talk about the Zapatistas. Uh, the Zapatistas were based on a movement in, uh, which started off in 1994 in the southern part of Mexico called the Chiapas. And the, on January 1st, 1994, the day the North American Free Trade Agreement was signed was when the Zapatista rebellion broke out. And it's, uh, so what essentially happened is uh, the Chiapas, the southernmost part of Mexico, was po populated by a majority of the indigenous population. And there, at that point of time, looking at it health-wise, their life expectancy was almost 30 years less than the rest of Mexican population. And Mexico itself wasn't great to start off with. So the Zapatista movement was to bring autonomy and uh, community participation in their health. So some of the things that the health professionals there did was one, to make sure that health policy was at a community level. So health policy was not something decided by the uh, Israelan at the level of Chiapas, but every village could decide their own health policy. And only things that uh, matter to the entire district were taken up to a higher level. Central interventions were there only for much bigger decisions. They also had much smaller health uh, networks and a large amount of autonomy when it came to making decisions. It's interesting to note that uh, yes, from morning, we've, we've heard the talk about uh, plurality and, and health systems. And the Zapatista health system uh, acknowledged not just what, what we call as Western health systems, but indigenous systems as well, and incorporated it as much. Uh, Next, what I'd like to talk about uh, is Rojava. Rojava, the, the free state of Rojava is, was formed in the northeast part of Syria. Uh, following the Syrian civil war and ISIS was when Rojava was formed primarily by the forces from Kurdistan. 
and Roja Mama is interesting to study because one, it is much, uh, it is much more recent. It happened following Syrian civil war in mid 2010s, and uh, northeastern Syria, which had a population of two million and had 700 doctors serving there initially, after both the wars and ISIS uh, and their freedom struggle, found that they had only 100 doctors left to serve a population of two million. One doctor to a much higher population than what WHO says it as, but. Uh, the government of Rojava then got an opportunity to reimagine their health system. And in their reimagining of health system, which was uh, frontlined by their own medical professionals, was one, to solve the problem between relation, problem of relations between health and power and the party. So understanding that health is too strongly controlled by state and market forces, and it should not be so. To rebuild the relationship between society of doctors and to return ownership of health to society. Uh, the the plank of their entire health reorganization and health uh, policy formation was based on self determination and mutual solidarity. Some people say uh, others, not Rojavans themselves, declare themselves to be an anarchist state. Uh, but yeah, this is on those principles. The last is the People's Health Movement. I won't talk much about this because very senior members of the People's Health Movement who've been working for decades through it are in the audience today. Uh, uh, so, but uh, but in brief, it's a global network of grassroots health activists, civil society organizations, and academic institutions uh, around 70 countries in the world, working against inequality, poverty, exploitation, violence, and injustice. And uh, equity and sustainable development and peace are something that are core to their own philosophy of it. Now, uh, how I came across People's Health Movement, uh, or Okay, my interactions with it. One has been a campaign to right to health that has been going on across countries. Um, the recent right to health bill in Rajasthan was pushed by a lot of members of the Rajasthan chapter of the People's Health Movement. Uh, for us as students and young health professionals, the, a publication by the People's Health Movement called the Global Health Watch has been of use. A lot of what I got from this presentation is from those books. Uh, and also I'd like to point out since we are in Tamil Nadu, the, the local chapter, the Makkal Nalwar Vayakam, which is the Tamil Nadu chapter of the People's Health Move, of PHM Global, uh, has been working with government and government agencies for the decade. So, for example, before any election comes up, uh, they uh, hold assemblies with people and get uh, what people and the community feels about health and put out a list of demands, take it to political parties and try to push before and after election that uh, these things have been pushed. Uh, I, I chose these three examples for a particular reason. One, because both the Zapatistas and Rojava was when health policy and the policy towards equity was redefined when a new state was formed. And new states per se are formed quite rarely. And the third as PHM, because it's a su supra state actor, something that is exists outside state and not bound by state laws and working with different states and nations as a whole. Uh, I think th what, what uh, the point I'm trying to make is that health policy reflects and accommodates the prevalent social, political, and economic movements of that time. I'd like to illustrate this with an example. So if you look at India has had three national health policies so far. The first one in 1983, uh, right in the shadow of Alma Atta, where uh, it was recognized by the Indian government at that point of time that we need to prioritize primary care. The second in 2002, 10 years after our markets have, woken, uh, have opened up, where the policy in itself, uh, the policy admitted that it is difficult to conceive an exclusive government mechanism and we need to have a large space for private players in health. And lastly, the third one in 2017, where insurance-based financing strategy was essentially a given, where in essence, I know I'm being reductionist, but in essence, the government washing its hands off a lot of the responsibility of health and saying we're going to purchase it from private players instead. Um, so now, uh, with uh, I mean, with the point that health policy is reflecting of the times, uh, what are the times we live in now, and what can we do towards our work towards uh, equality now? So looking at it currently, one, I don't think there is much question or much fight against the fact that the global neoliberal order is what is existing. I don't think we can, I don't know how to fight for a new economic order or to fight for a new way of economic organization. 
there is a rapidly changing political climate across the world the far right across the world is right uh, is, is rising coming to power from little autocrats to full blown fascism and i don't know how the far right will ever have equity as one of its uh, something that it considers uh, important there is large level corporatization even the language we talk has become more corporate and even the way we uh, even the way we deal and approach equity uh, things like performance based uh, incentives for uh, uh, incentives for doing work and so on and also the general feeling of technocracy that technic that technology will solve all of our problems and even underlying structural issues that have existed for millennia will go away because we have the technology now to make it go away so how do we ensure that equity in health policies in this climate uh, we thought about this a lot um, in within the 12th september movement and we, we we thought of a few things that what we could do so uh, the first is related to the politics of knowledge and information uh, i i think um, ritu ma'am had spoken about this uh, at length in the morning of uh, the politics of knowledge but i'll just add to uh, add some of what we thought uh, and some of what what we came across uh, what we can do as physicians and health professionals is see where our research priorities lie uh even in my experience working here in the 3 years that i did work as faculty here uh, all of the research priorities are not what what the community needed but what some funder gives the money for and we don't know what why that funder is giving money for so and so uh it also impacts on who gets access to what who gets access to what knowledge medical publishing and medical knowledge can you either need to be rich to access it or rich to publish in it and uh, pharma and every other industry has their hands deep in it and pol policies are essentially driven through creation of knowledge so the more we push for more we as health professionals push for something the more uh, the higher likelihood that policies will happen with it um another thing is equity within our own systems a lot of people will talk about comprehensive primary health care models but most of those models are built on exploitation of women's labor uh, and every other form of uh, exploitation there is um like for example i think 70% of the total health global health workforce uh, is by women but they are also the most underpaid even our own primary health comprehensive primary health care models here where i used to work was based on women being paid criminally low wages uh, our our associations are we strong enough uh, before that uh, are we as a medical community representative of the population and are medical bodies representative of us i'd like to use an example for this so this is from the prime minister's high level survey in 2016 so it looks at what percentage of the population exists in india currently and how are they reflected in the undergraduate and postgraduate medical seats so if you look at general hindu for example their population is just 24% but they represent 60% of the undergraduate seats and almost 80% of the pg seats uh, whereas if we move on to obcs 30 years after the mandal commission though they form 35% of the population their representation in pg seats across india is just 5% uh, similar to for scs and sts and for muslims so for this is for india um if you look at the odds ratio as say compared to muslim is taken as one general hindu has a 8.8 .8 odds of being uh, represented uh, for post graduation now this is what the medical body is and all policy bodies and further bodies will be representative of this so health policies will remain like all policies uh by the few making policies for the many the few people who have had the social and financial capital to reach these halls will be making it for it and uh this i am not even talking about uh conventional associations and groups so like iapsm or whatever this uh this same uh, imbalance and misrepresentation is there through most alternate most alternate associations too whether gandhian or left or anything um uh, so yes uh, uh, lastly about our coalitions are we as coalitions organized enough to take on forces against equity i'd i'd like to give an example so for example cmc has been working with the pesticides and finding it as a problem but uh, identifying that as a medical problem will then and even whatever coalitions go behind it we are then up against the might of big pesticide and corporations across the world and all the money they have and all the legal pushes they have and all the connections they have i don't know whether we are um we have identified uh, from our discussions uh, we've come to we thought of 
four basic things that are blocking equity, especially health equity, but equity in general everywhere. Uh, neoliberalism, imperialism, racism and casteism, and patriarchy. And I don't think we can work towards equity in health without addressing any of these uh, as a base. So um, to, to conclude, what is the health professional's role in bringing equity through health policy? Uh, these are six points that we thought of. One, we need to have equity in knowledge creation. Why do we create medical knowledge? For whom do we create and how do we spread it? Uh, second, intersectionality. I don't think the war for, uh, I don't think, the, okay, maybe war, the fight for equity uh, can be won just by looking at medical equity. We need to have equity in all sides or we are not going to have equity in any. For example, uh, I, I think the fight against casteism by the Ambedkarite movement and the fight against Hindi imposition by the Periyarist movement and the fight for equality by the feminist movement all need to go hand in hand along with us to fight for equity in health to achieve equity in any sense. Uh, there, we re as doctors, we do, uh, we surely need to have sharing of power because even in most of our discourses, we still, all of the de uh, decisions are still being made by medical doctors, though we form a very small part of the workforce that actually brings health, uh, that actually brings health to people. Um, we need to strengthen our movements further and have cross solidarity. We need to broaden our own definitions of health and we need to address the causes of causes of causes. Uh, for example, um, I'll just give you an example of anemia. We as a medical community have been trying to fight against anemia for decades now, but we are not really going uh, anywhere with it. And I think we, we can't just fight anemia looking at just the medical uh, part of it, but we need to fight for equality when it comes to when it comes to diet, when it comes to labor laws, unions, everything. Uh, I'd like to end with two quotes by two people who I feel really understood equity and health more than any of us. Uh, the first is by Marx. It says philosophers have only interpreted the world in different ways. The point, however, is to change it. Uh, looking at it from a medical point of view, I, I would like to interpret this as uh, I feel at at some level, all the knowledge we need to make humanity healthy is already there with us. It's just a point of whether we act on it or not. Uh, the second uh, actually it sums up the six points we uh, put. I put in the previous slide uh, is from Ambedkar, which is educate, uh, organize, and agitate. Uh, these are my references. I would like to thank Dr. Anand Zakria, uh, Rakhal, who helped me with this presentation, Srimati Abhay and Christianus, who also helped me with this, and all of you. Uh, thank you. No pasaran. Uh, thank you, Harsh. That was a, <clears throat> a very good panoramic presentation of the history of uh, health equity and the progression and the, you said, the loss of hope in the equity. Uh, I I'd like. Okay. Uh, there's a question. One question. Yeah. And, uh, question is: Neoliberalism is based on. Um, okay. Based on unregulated labor, what do you think of reviving labor unions and addressing some of the unfair labor policies, especially for migrant labors? I am in full support of unionization. I feel everyone should be unionized. Uh, labor laws over the years are slowly being watered down in India, even in states which had strong labor unions. Uh, slowly they are being pushed away. Um, I think there is a very good case to show that labor uh, and enough evidence to show that uh, in place, for example, in factories and large industries where workers have labor rights and they are able to bargain for their health, they do end up being healthy. So yes, I feel we need to organize more and labor unions need to be strengthened, given power. Okay, I have another question because there is no other question here. And the question is this, <clears throat> you showed us a slide about, about um, the NEAT slide, All India NEAT slide. Yeah. You, you The different classes and the NEAT, the people who made it, 
Now, uh, it so happened that I looked at the statistics about a week ago, and I looked at the Tamil Nadu, and I looked at the UP, and I found that it was exactly the opposite. Yeah. In Tamil Nadu, a lot of people from the poorer classes got into NEET, but it was exactly the opposite in UP. Now, so what can we learn from the Tamil Nadu uh, approach to health or through the other approaches or the holistic approach? What has made it different so that we can learn to apply it in the other states? I think uh, Tamil Nadu from 1967 has had a history of extremely progressive and policies rooted in social justice. Uh, from 67, uh, I think in 67, uh, Tamil Nadu is the first state to implement 69. The reservation is 69. And what was the cause of that? The Dravidian movement. Uh, oh. Periyar and Anna. Uh, uh, the history of social justice movements in Tamil Nadu. Uh, with it, and I think uh, that has uh, that has echoed through the years. Uh, there is a saying in Tamil Nadu that whoever rules, whoever is the chief minister, it is Anna who is ruling. And uh, I think even after that, the way they approached health, for example, uh, having a reservation for people who work in PHCs for for uh, PG, ensured that all the PHCs are staffed, and other things like uh, for the the midday meal and so on. So I think it is social justice movements, larger social movements that ensured that policies, health and education, stayed within the confines of justice that helped. Uh, education, uh, did it come early in Tamil Nadu? With Midday Mill first came in Tamil. Tamil education. Yeah. I mean, education came to Tamil Nadu very early. I, I am not. Okay. <clears throat> but thank you for that. Is I think the social justice movement was the main reason, but I think even before that, there was the education that happened, so that empowered the people. So, <clears throat> other questions? So, uh, first of all, thank you, Hirsch, for you know, for giving this rude shock at the end of the first day. Almost, no, we're not at the end of the first day, but. Um, about telling us that you know equity is not just medical equity that you and I think you 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 showed the uh, the the perspective that one should have in addressing other um, other other ways in which we should look at equity and uh, you did you know I, I would I would hope that you had you know elaborated on the various aspects of the policy uh, uh, suggestion that you made the six of those that you made. Uh, but I know I I couldn't imagine in the in the, the way we are structuring this presentations. Oh, sorry, you don't have so much time to do that. But um, I would just end up with one question. Uh, you know, the entire presentation sort of you suggested that you don't seem to be so optimistic about these things happening. Is that a correct one assumption or and and I would really wish if you can additionally suggest ways to be more hopeful, if you can, for looking at those aspects, besides the medical equity that we are going to discuss, as a pro program suggests to me in the next three days, we are mainly discussing medical equity. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to be hopeful, uh, but I, I think, uh, I think uh, we as doctors fighting for equity, uh, within the larger medical community are a much smaller group as compared to lawyers or teachers or journalists or anyone else doing it within their communities. I mean, that, that is my guess. And uh, I'm, I'm a little hopeful. Uh, <laughs> okay. If there are no other questions, then we'll close here. Thank you for that talk. I request Dr. Vinod Shah to present the memento to Dr. Harsh.